Well, whenever you're, whenever you're ready. Yep, go right ahead. Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, this is a collaborative effort. Uh, it was funded by the Bruin uh, Morris family, uh, and it's a collaborative effort with Claire Francomano at Indiana University, mm -hmm. Professor Jane Dubart at Penn State, who's an expert on surgical outcome studies, Peter Rowe at Johns Hopkins, uh, the brilliant Miles Kirby, neuroradiologist, my two collaborators, uh, Melanie Narayan and, and uh, Rob Rosenbaum, and our nurses who are superb, Kelly Tuckman and uh, Susan Mills, who did the data collection. So uh, two years ago, I presented work on a five-year follow-up of 20 EDS patients with cranial cervical instability who underwent occipital cervical fusion. Uh, this, this work uh, is a, a look at 50 patients who underwent, uh, 50 EDS patients who underwent surgery for instability and a comparison with a less severe non-operative group of uh, 24 patients. So uh, in this talk, we want to emphasize that connective tissue disorders may manifest with lax ligaments at the cranial cervical junction. The decisions to proceed with the fusion are based on really standard findings and uh, indications. And we want to discuss the positive outcomes of the surgical group compared to the non-operative. We're very familiar with the, uh, degenerative connective tissue disorders like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and uh, osteoarthritis. And uh, we're also somewhat uh, familiar with the hereditary connective tissue disorders like osteogenesis imperfecta and Marfan. But there are 50 different hereditary connective tissue disorders. And I noted in that uh, fabulous talk, uh, uh, but that um, of the Chiari uh, uh, patients in the uh, chromosome study, that seven of them had EDS, and that seemed to represent the largest number of the hereditary connective tissue disorders. Um, but there are 13 uh, of the 50 hereditary connective tissue disorders. The Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are the most common, and there are 13 of them. And uh, we see them in neurosurgery and spine surgery, the five types that may present with kyphoscoliosis, again, which speaks to uh, the earlier study of uh, looking at uh, scoliosis in the Chiari group. Uh, and there are four types of EDS that may present with vasculopathy, aneurysm rupture, aneurysm dissections, and so on. But uh, perhaps fortunately, the most common type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is the hypermobile type. And this is uh, generally fairly uh, uh, not difficult to recognize. They're mostly characterized by hypermobility, as the name implies. And you can do a rapid assessment in the office by simply bending up the fifth digit if it bends 90 degrees. Does the thumb bend back to the forearm? Is does the uh, elbow and the knee hyperextend? Is the patient able to place both palms on the floor? If if any five of these are present in an adult, that would constitute a condition of hypermobility. These patients also have poor wound healing, uh, very soft, stretchy skin, and easy bruising. And when parents show up in the emergency room with children, show with this bruising, they're often eyed with a lot of uh, suspicion. When the patients show up in the office, they're often high adrenaline. Uh, there may be midriasis, some sweating. Uh, these patients have a, a lot of comorbid conditions like GI problems, temporomandibular uh, joint dysfunction. There may be um, bluish sclerae. They have premature degenerative disc disease. Uh, and many have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome uh, on this. Uh, tilt table plot on the left, the lower blue line is the resting heart rate lying down. And upon tilting the table upward, if there's an increase in heart rate by more than 30 beats in adult, that would constitute postural orthostatic tachycardia, where there may be neurally mediated hypotension with a sudden drop in blood pressure. And we recently published uh, two papers, one in World Neurosurgery, looking at refractory syncope and presyncope in 
uh, this group of patients, especially with atlantoaxial instability, and we showed that uh, stabilizing this joint uh, led to a statistically significant improvement in syncope and presyncope. So about 10 or 12 years ago, the geneticists began noticing that craniocervical instability can cause uh, significant or result in deformation of the brainstem and spinal cord. And uh, it's been shown, of course, that ligaments are the major stabilizing structures between cranium and spine. So it's not uh, hard to understand how a disorder characterized by ligamentous laxity is going to present with craniocervical instability. Uh, I mentioned the study we presented uh, two years ago of 20 subjects who underwent occipital cervical fusion for instability with cervical medullary syndrome. And we saw a statistically significant improvement in the headache, neck pain, vertigo, balance, walking, Kanofsky performance, and so on. So we, we wanted to come back with a larger group of patients. This is only one year's follow-up. But we're looking at 50 patients of a surgical group compared to a less severe non-operative group and we asked this question, does elimination of craniocervical instability in this EDS population through reduction, fusion, and stabilization improve patients' pain symptoms of the cervical medullary syndrome and, and neurologic disability? And our inclusion criteria for the study were a formal diagnosis of HEDS or hypermobility spectrum disorder closely related, severe head, ache, or neck pain, cervical medullary syndrome symptoms, demonstrable neurologic deficits, uh, the radiological metrics of instability, and failure of non-operative management. So uh, surgery is really the last option in this group. Now, for the non-surgical comparison group, the inclusion criteria were a little bit softer. As I said, most of these patients, we did not actually uh, uh, offer, sur uh, offer surgery. They had to have a diagnosis, had, had to have moderate, at least moderate headache and uh, neck pain. They had uh, cervical medullary syndrome symptoms. They all had radiological metrics of instability, uh, but they did not have significant neurological findings. In a consensus statement uh, now uh, eight years ago in California, of 17 institutions present, we came up with three important radiological metrics to look at potential for instability and uh, compression of the brainstem and spinal cord. And the first was the clival axial angle, the angle between the clivus and the posterior axial line. And this is normally 150 degrees. Uh, in uh, EDS, it's often less and less than 135 degrees is considered potentially pathological. So the importance of the kyphotic clival axial angle is not being lost on, on a lot of authors. And we performed an extensive review of the clival axial angle and published that uh, a few years ago. Second measurement was the grab map stone oaks measurement. And they looked at uh, a group of, uh, of patients with Chiari mal uh, malformation who underwent decompressive surgery. And they noted a number of them did not get better. And they reported that for patients with less than ideal immediate or long-term outcomes after posterior fossa decompression, ventral cervical medullary compression should be considered as a cause of neurological deterioration. So they came up with this measurement, uh, which we call the grab oaks measurement, which is that interval from the dura to a line drawn from the basion to the posterior interior C2. If that measurement is more than nine millimeters, that's potentially pathological ventral brainstem compression. Now the Harris measurement, uh, Harris looked at 400 set normal subjects without headache and neck pain with plain x-ray, which have a little bit of, uh, amp you know, the view is amplified and enlarged. They found um, that none of their normal subjects had a Bayesian to posterior axial line of 12 millimeters or more. 
and none had a Bayesian to a dontoid measurement of 12 millimeters or more. So they said that if you have a Bayesian axis interval of 12 millimeters or more, you have instability. So here's a, one of our patients with a Bayesian to axis interval to the posterior axial line of 15 millimeters. So that's quite pathological. And you can see the ventral brainstem compression there, by the way. And on the right is a vertical Harris measurement, Bayesian dental interval of 16 millimeters. And that was very uh, abnormal, of course. So um, now there's a corollary. Normally, between flexion on the left and extension on the right, the Bayesian pivots over the midpoint of the odontoid. And um, this, this pivot point should not translate. It should be should remain in the same position. It should not move by more than a millimeter. And so if we obtain a flexion extension CT MRI, either lying down or better still upright, we can measure these Bayesian axis intervals. And on the left, it's 12 millimeters, abnormal. On the right, it's seven millimeters. So the Bayesian axis interval decreased by five millimeters, and that's uh, potentially pathological. We also looked at the lantoaxial rotary subluxation because they share the same ligaments. If you're unstable at occiput C1, you're usually going to be unstable at C12. And if you see loss of the overlap of the facet joint uh, on head rotation, if there's more than 80% loss of facet overlap, that's an indication of instability upper left. If you look lower right, the measurement, the angular displacement on full neck rotation between C1 and C2 is normally 25 to 35 uh, degrees. If it's more than 41 degrees, then you have rotary, uh, uh, lantoaxial rotary subluxation, and you're gonna have obstruction of flow through the arteries and, uh, and CSF. The upper right, you'll see that with this subluxation, uh, a fielding type one, the atlantodental interval is preserved, it's normal, uh, and the, uh, the spinal canal space is uh, diminished. And uh, speaking to uh, the excellent talk by Dr. Toro, uh, obstruction of CSF flow uh, is going to affect uh, not only the uh, intracranial pressure, but the uh, also venous flow. And I, I, I think this, I, I'm, I think that Professor Toro is under something extremely important there. And these mathematical relationships, especially at the frame of Monroe, are extraordinarily important. So the criteria for the occipital cervical fusion required at least two, and most of these patients had three of these findings, a Harris measurement greater than 12 millimeters or translation more than four millimeters, and uh, a grab oaks more than nine millimeters or a kyphotic clavulaxial angle less than 135 degrees, or a Chiari with obstruction of CSF flow or atlanto axial instability. The uh, operative procedure was very standard and uh, interoperatively, we, uh, the surgeon, myself, took the head and traction, posterior translation, extension, and our goal was to restore the clivalaxial angle to greater than 140 degrees to establish a, a normal orbital axial angle, that's the gaze angle, at about 100 degrees, and to maintain the mandible axial interval at 10 to 20 millimeters. Uh, we published a more detailed report of how we do the reduction in uh, curious. So here's the uh, craniospinal fusion. Uh, with this system, we're able to actually insert the bone graft into the suboccipital plate, which makes for extremely tight fitting graft. Uh, it is allograft infused with bone marrow aspirin, and that's a typical uh, fusion. I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Jane Schubert. Uh, thank you, Fraser. So, um, and good morning, everybody. I'm going to um, tell you about the study that we've just recently completed. So we had two groups, 
the surgical group included adults diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and craniocervical instability who underwent reduction, alignment, stabilization, and fusion procedures for their CCI. All of the surgeries were performed by the senior author and his colleagues at a single institution between 2018 and 2020. In our comparison group of 22, also adults diagnosed with EDS and CCI who did not undergo surgery. For 10 of these um, patients, surgery was recommended but not pursued. And for 12, the surgery was not recommended because the surgical threshold was not reached. Our primary outcomes um, included uh, head and neck pain. We looked at both the severity and frequency pain medication use, uh, symptom improvement. Um, we looked at patient function as measured by the Karnofsky Performance Status Scale and satisfaction with the surgery. So the potential study subjects were invited by the senior author to participate. Those who agreed to participate were then sent follow-up survey questionnaires via REDCap. Uh, that uh, stands for Research Electronic Data Capture, which is our institutional data collection and, and management system. The questionnaires included uh, covered head and neck pain, other symptoms, functional status, quality of life, satisfaction with survey, surgery, uh, subsequent hospitalizations, ER visits, pain medication use. So for the patients who completed these follow-up survey questionnaires, then the study nurse abstracted relevant data from the clinical records. So you see we have two sources of data for our study. So what were the results? <laughs> okay, we had, um, there were 85 patients who met the study inclusion criteria. There were some excluded, uh, one patient, died due to conditions uh, unrelated to, to her surgery, um, and that happened about six months after her surgery. Two patients had surgery elsewhere. There were seven who did not cl complete the follow-up questionnaires. So the result was a final study cohort that included 53 patients in the surgical group and 22 in the comparison group. Um, this was uh, largely a, a this was a, a largely a female uh, population, 95%. Also, a younger population. The mean uh, the median age in the surgery group was 32 years, uh, 37 in the comparison group. Predominantly Caucasian, not Hispanic. And um, important, um, both cohorts reported many comorbid conditions. Um, at least two, the median was eight, and, and some 20 or more. The list below were the, the most frequently reported, including mast cell activation syndrome, degenerative disc disease, orthostatic intolerance, and POTS, uh, various GI issues that you'll see listed there. I'm not, I won't read those, but typical of patients with uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and also TMJ syndrome. The average time between the onset of symptoms to the diagnosis of CCI um, in this population was 12 years. Gradual, the onset was gradual for most of the patients, um, uh, not abrupt. The surgical cohort had more neurologic deficits, um, predominantly long track findings such as weakness, Romberg sign, and you can see some of the others that we we found uh, listed. Okay, the radiological metrics were the same for both groups uh, preoperatively. Um, so these are the mean measurements, um, and you can see in blue are the p-values, and none of those are statistically significant. Uh, um, the basal axis interval, inflection, 11, uh, very little difference. The translation, uh, flexion extension, about five, and C1, C2 angular displacement, again, not no, no difference there. OK. 
Okay. Also, um, the mean measurements were the same in the uh, clivoaxial angle and the grab oaks measurements, um, uh, 128, exactly the same. Grab oaks, you know, there's a nine. However, um, both the clivoaxial angle and the grab oaks measurement both show improvement postoperatively that, in fact, was um, significant. So for grab oaks, 128 to uh, 142.8 at um, that's pre-op versus post-op, uh, highly significant at 0 0.001, as was um, I'm sorry that was the yeah that was the clivo axial angle, as was the the grab oaks um, improved from 9.1 to about six, and again that was um, also highly significant. The surgical cohort had a mean hospital length of stay of four days, ranging from two to eight days. There were no intraoperative complications. There were six unplanned reoperations related to poor wound healing. Um, this is um, not uncommon due to the skin uh, features of patients with Ehlers Danlos syndromes. Of those six, one patient underwent revision of the fusion. Okay, this is, um, this is probably our most important outcome. Head, headache and neck pain were much improved in the surgical cohort um, and not improved in the non-surgical cohort. So we asked four questions. Um, we asked, has your head pain changed in severity? And then has neck pain changed in severity? And then uh, head pain, the frequency and neck pain frequency. These were asked on the follow-up patient survey questionnaires. You can see the scale there. A1 is very much improved, two much improved, three minimally improved, four indicates no change, and then five uh, minimally worse, much worse, and a seven very much worse. So looking across at the median change, uh, the median scores, the surgery group um, across all four questions reported much improved, the two. Uh, in contrast, the comparison group reported four, which is uh, no change, and all four of these outcomes were highly statistically significant. Okay, next change. Okay, another important outcome, the change in uh, medication use in opioid use. So, um, 10 of the blue, the blue bars are the surgery patients. So 10 of those patients reported taking more opioid, uh, 15 taking the same, and the majority, um, 27 of the surgery patients were taking less. Um, the patients that take, we know that patients um, in this group, they take medications for, for many reasons. Okay. Okay, this slide, this, these are the pre-post surgery symptom improvement. We assessed a number of symptoms. And uh, so these are the symptoms that reached a high threshold of statistical significance at P less than 0 0.001. Uh, neurological symptoms included dizziness, lightheadedness, presyncope, again, headache and neck pain, loss of consciousness, uh, syncope, concentration difficulties, nausea, vomiting, incoordination, also fatigue, and then musculoskeletal symptoms that included joint pain, neck pain on bumpy roads, and muscle pain at rest. Again, these were at a higher, a high threshold. There were others. Um, these symptoms also pre-post improvement. These were um, at less than the standard uh, 0.05 threshold. Neurological uh, included vertigo, dystonias, memory loss, double vision, photosensitivity, facial numbness, um, leg and arm weakness, speech difficulty, photosensitivity, um, some additional musculoskeletal skeletal symptoms, cramps, stiff, stiff muscles, pain in the legs while walking. And here we have more of the GI symptoms, uh, not surprising uh, to us, abdominal pain, bloating, constipation, heartburn, GERD, diarrhea, and then um, symptoms uh, reflecting autonomic issues, heart palpitation, chest pain, 
uh, shortness of breath, uh, fingers changing colored, kind of a Renaud-like phenomena, heat intolerance, and elevated uh, temperature. Okay. Okay, this is another important um, outcome. We used the uh, Karnofsky performance scale to measure patient function. This is a measure of the ability to do just ordinary daily kinds of tasks. The scale is a zero to 100. Zero means dead and 100 is normal. So if we look at the upper left plot, uh, that plot shows, that is at uh, baseline, and that shows that the uh, surgery group is more severely affected at baseline with, uh, than the comparison group with a median um, of 50. And the, so the comparison group was substantially um, better um, with a median of 60 reflecting less disability. The plot in the upper right shows that the surgery group, this is the change so um, in scores and shows that the surgery group had improvement in their scores, uh, not unexpectedly, the comparison group did not. And both those p-values are significant. You see the 0 0.04 and 0 0.03. Okay. So we asked this question, um, the satisfaction question. In looking back, I would still choose to have the craniocervical surgery. And you'll see from the bar chart there, almost all agreed with the statement and uh, only three patients disagreed. So some of the reasons given for um, not having improvement in ability to work or, or go to school, 100% um, of the patients mentioned other medical problems related to their comorbid conditions, um, including musculoskeletal pain. Some patients were awaiting other surgeries, fatigue, dysautonomia, dystonia, intracranial pressure, joint locations, uh, various vascular issues, endometriosis, adrenal insufficiency, and, and several patients reported recent motor vehicle accidents. All studies had limitations. Uh, these are, are some um, I'd like to mention. Again, this was at a single institution. So that would impact you know, the generalizability of our results. Um, we used retrospective chart review to collect some of our data. So that's um, a data that wasn't collected specifically for the study. Um, our, our, we have variable patient follow-up times in this study. Uh, ideally, you know, in a prospective study, we would be measuring follow-up at, at established set intervals three months, six months, a year, whatever. For some patients, we have short follow-up time. And again, um, you know, our patients had many comorbid conditions. This presents a challenge. Um, it creates a difficulty in detecting a signal of the neurosurgical intervention from the, from the background noise of these other problems. Many were needing surgery for other neurological conditions. Intervening events are, are not known, and we have no control for the uh, placebo effect. So thinking ahead to a future study, some of the next steps and things to consider, um, consider the inclusion criteria, specifically addressing decompression with stabilization <laughs> and so forth. Also to consider the criteria for the appropriate comparison group. Um, consider how we um, account for these many comorbid conditions in the airless standless um, patients. Also accounting for treatment interventions such as the use of opioids, um, neck brace, other therapies, physical, physical therapy, and, and so on. And finally, accounting for other intervening events and hospitalizations for uh, other reasons. So in conclusion, um, we found that compared to patients who did not have CCI surgery, that patients in the surgical group reported improved outcomes, um, improved outcomes in head and neck pain, both in severity and frequency, 
in reducing use of pain medication, um, in the range of symptom improvement, and in uh, and in patient in their function as measured by the Karnofsky performance scales, all all very significant. And and finally, our surgical patients reported high satisfaction with their surgery. Um, so Fraser uh, uh, mentioned our team. Um, again, I want to acknowledge and thank the Bruin Morris Family Foundation for their funding, uh, Dorothy Poppy uh, for, for her ongoing support of our research, uh, Claire Francamano, there's a typo I just now see, that's Indiana University and our other team members. Uh, this was uh, truly a team effort. So with that, um, Fraser, I'll kind of hand it back to you and we'll take some, any questions or comments? Absolutely, thank you both. Um, any questions um, similarly to the way that we've been doing it, just feel free to turn on your camera and, no, oh, got one. Uh, Dr. Blitz won his camera button, so <laughs> you get to go first. Thank you for a nice presentation. I, I just have one or two questions. I, I think from what you said, and I may have missed this, I apologize if I did, that this was a retrospective study. And uh, were the subjects enrolled uh, uniformly postoperatively? And if so, uh, could there be some bias in enrollment? In other words, how many patients were operated on during the study period who were not enrolled in the study? Yeah, this was a sequential series. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there's no bias. Well, all the data, we normally collect all this data prospectively, but it was retrospectively reviewed. Right. Uh, but, but all of the initial data was collected, you know, in the office and then very detailed uh, questionnaires were sent out, uh, you know, at the time of the, that we put the study together. Okay, so essentially all of the patients operated on that during that time were enrolled in the study. Correct. Okay, thank you. Dr. Grant? Fraser, Jane, nice, nice series. Um, it's always impressive to see, you know, your, your results. And I just wonder if you can comment, not so much on your series, but in general, you know, when you see patients that, you know, maybe have not done well after the fusion, I always wonder, is it due to the angle that they were fused or that they weren't potentially distracted during the fusion? I wonder if you can just comment on kind of ways that you've seen that there's failures due to how the technical side to help us uh, figure out what to do with some of these patients who aren't doing well. Yeah, I think uh, several points there, Jerry. Uh, first, uh, I think that getting a good clival axial angle is really important, you know, more than 140 degrees, or at least 20 degrees more than the preoperative clival axial angle, uh, number one. Number two, uh, I'd say the majority of these patients have problems below C2. So uh, you may fuse the cranium to C2, but then they have instability at C3, 4, C4, 5, or lower down. And many patients have temporomandibular joint syndrome, and that can mimic uh, suboccipital neuralgia. Many patients have intracranial hypertension, uh, abnormal venous flow. Uh, we should get Dr. Toro to see all of these patients. <laughs> Uh, so the number of comorbid conditions is great. So when they come back, if they're still having pain, it doesn't necessarily reflect on the surgery. It means they've got other issues that need to be worked out. Thanks. Okay. Thank Any you. other questions? All right. Well, then, in that case, I'm going to pull up the next slides. Oh, gosh. 